Good morning, if you will be turning in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7 is where we'll be headed this morning. It's good to to see such a good crowd uh, this morning, actually. The last few weeks or so, it's been kind of, I guess, half and half between the inside and the outside, but it's good to see so many faces that I can see personally. Uh, Of course, it's also good that we have so many outside as well, especially for those of you that may be visiting. I see visitors inside, but I'm sure we have some outside. We're Glad to have you all uh, here this morning. It's good to hear uh, Brother Coleman lead a prayer this morning. I always uh, enjoy getting to hear his voice. And of course, I appreciate his prayer that he led for us just a few moments ago. So in our study, we have come uh, to the end of the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, frankly, I didn't know how many lessons it would take me to get to the end of the Sermon on the Mount, but I guess nine was the magic number. Um, I think I've done this once before and it took me three lessons, so I guess it Either I'm getting better or I'm getting worse. I'm not sure uh, how that works out. But again, we've come to the end of this sermon. And as we've gone through several things that Jesus has taught us here in the Sermon on the Mount, I would ask you, you know, he, have you been challenged? And the reason I ask that is because He has challenged His audience with a lot of hard teaching. That's because many of the things that we've seen that a follower of the Lord is called to do for example, part of the reason it's hard is because it's, it's contrary to our human nature. For example, we're called, based, uh, called to act based on love. Not love of self, but love of our God and our neighbor. Also, we've talked about in the Sermon on the Mount, it's very clear that a follower of Christ is going to be very distinct from the rest of the world. Our mindset and our focus, it's going to be very different from that of the world. And as we've been talking about the last couple of weeks, it's going to cause us to treat others differently than what we would if we were of the world. So as we conclude the lesson here this morning, we're going to look at the last few sections. And Jesus is going to show us in a variety of ways that we are going to have choices as to whether or not we serve God. As we consider that theme that He has been focusing on, the kingdom of heaven, we have to understand that before we close, that to be a citizen of the kingdom of heaven, you're not going to be a citizen unless you make the choice to be that citizen. We're going to be faced with different options in our life, but hopefully from this lesson we're going to see that it is important that we choose to serve God in all that we do. Anytime I think about this concept of making choices in our service to God, especially, I would say especially when we're studying Matthew, but even when we're not studying Matthew, I think we often think of these first two verses that we're going to read here in Matthew chapter 7. He says in verse 13, he says, Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are few. As y'all been getting to know me, I probably would guess that I'm not very big on poetry. <laughs> That's just not one of my things. I like music, but I'm not big on poetry. But anytime I read this passage in Matthew chapter 7, I can't help but think of a poem. Probably the only poem that I really remember or even halfway understood. And that's the poem that Robert Frost published, The Road Not Taken. Uh, if you've studied poetry at all, you've probably heard of that, that poem. But that poem, it illustrates the concept of a choice in life. And it illustrates it by putting the reader in a position where there's a fork in the road and you have to decide because there are two paths and both of the paths are very different and both paths lead to very different places. And you can't choose both. So when you make the choice, you better choose carefully. For one of our options in our choice in life, he describes for us this wide gate. Not only that, but he says that this wide gate, the path to this wide gate is very easy. You're imagining this in a very figurative sense as he's talking in, 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 a symbol, in a symbolic way, but in the figurative sense, you're thinking about this path to this wide gate. I want to imagine this for a second. This road is very well paved. It's not bumpy. It's very smooth. You know, there's plenty along, you know, it's a long journey. There's plenty of rest stops along the way. I even would say at this point in modern era, there's even a Bucky's on this path. The thing is, is that because it's easy and because of all the, the, how nice it is, many choose this course. 
The reality is, is that this Y gate, it is a very popular destination all times of the year. And we always assume that whenever the majority of people choose a certain thing, we assume that the majority is always going to pick that which is good. At least that's what our human nature is, you know, points to. But the problem is that this path, it leads to destruction. You know, so many chose this easy path with the least amount of resistance, probably thinking they were choosing the way that was safe and secure. They were headed towards some great reward. But we read that the end is destruction. And of course, we understand the symbolism here. This is eternal destruction that he's comparing this to. You know, it almost makes you wonder if people knew what was at the end of that path, do you think that they would still choose that wide and easy path? I'm afraid that too many people choose the easy way because, again, the ride is more fun. There's more things along the way that they want to see, but either they don't know where they're going or maybe they just don't want to think about where they're going. They just want to enjoy the ride. He tells us at the start of this passage, though, that the gate that we should enter by, he says it's narrow. He also indicates that this way, it's going to be hard. And the thing is, is that a lot of people, they look down this path and they see how rough and how bumpy it looks, and it scares them away. And the thing is, is that Jesus doesn't sugarcoat the fact that you know, he's telling us that if we choose this path, it's going to cost us a lot. There's going to be persecution. There's going to be trials. There has to be sacrifice. And because of those things, few people choose to take this path. The difficulty of this path means that the majority, again, are not going to take it. And even many will start down this path, but because it's hard, they give up, they turn back, and they go back down the easy way. But then... There are a few, it says, that do stay the course. And the reason that they do that is because of what they know is waiting for them at the end of that road. And that's because this path, it leads to life. The other path, we said, was easy and wide. They would even have a lot of friends along the way. But this path that Jesus tells us to take, even though it's difficult, even though few choose to take it, He tells us to take it. Because that path, it leads to life. Understand from this passage, we're being taught the fact that choosing to serve the Lord, it is not going to be easy. In fact, from the world's perspective, it is very, very hard. But for those that belong to the kingdom, who he's talking to here, it is worth the trials because in the end, we get to live eternally with the Lord. So he tells us, choose the narrow way. Don't choose the way that is easy. And his why. He goes on in verses 15 through 20. He says, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you will recognize them by their fruit. So now we're being made aware of the fact that there are two kinds of prophets, or in our case you might could even say different types of teachers. There are false prophets, and of course the assumption is, is that there's also the good prophets as well. And you know, the topic of false teachers is not something that's just limited here to the Sermon on the Mount. That's a warning that we see all throughout the Scriptures, especially when we get into the epistles. It was even a topic in the book of Acts. And he describes for us different things that we need to be aware of because we need to make the choice of whether or not someone is a false prophet or teacher and whether they're the right. And the reason that we need to be able to make this choice is because false teachers are so dangerous. And we also need to be very alert. And why is that? Because he says that they are vicious wolves. Again, dangerous. But they're disguised. Again, there is so much warning in the Scriptures about false teachers because a false teacher that goes undetected, 
What can they do? What does a wolf do among a herd of sheep? It causes havoc. It causes problems within the church. Not only that, but false teachers are so dangerous because often the Scriptures tell us they may come from within. And that's when they're at their most dangerous. He makes the point that you may not always be able to tell a false teacher by looking on their outward opinion, uh, outward appearance, but you can tell them by what? By the fruit that he produces. It's almost like he's combining two different illustrations to make his point. In other words, those that are evil or those that are false, they will produce the bad fruit. And how do you determine what is bad fruit? Well, for example, I think a good way to start is do they teach one thing? but they practice another. He's been warning in this sermon about being hypocritical. Well, that certainly is a good place to start. What about their teaching? Does it result in division? Does it result in people turning away from God's will? Well, that's the bad fruit. You know, often what we do is we measure the success of a preacher or or some religious leader based on how many people that they're able to bring in as the result of their teaching and their efforts. Understand that's a bad measure. You know, the thing is, is that a false teacher, they may produce a ton of fruit. But is that fruit any good? Again, false teachers sometimes are very good at bringing in the crowds because, you know, what they teach is not the hard truth that Jesus is teaching here in the Sermon on the Mount. It's a message that man enjoys and man is attracted to. But again, it's not the truth that's going to lead them to God. It's important that we make, be able to make a distinction between that which is false and that which is good. Because for those that produce bad fruit, Jesus says what? They're going to be cast into the fire. In other words, there's punishment. When we're talking about choosing to serve God, we've got to make sure that we are alert, that we are watchful, especially for those that teach falsely because they may draw us away. And let's make sure that the standard for what we make our judgments on is God's Word. Because again, if we fail to do this and we fail to do this properly, what may happen is we may be led astray and we might produce bad fruit, which as this passage tells us, it may or it will lead us to punishment. He goes on to describe another scenario where we have to make a choice starting in verse 21. He says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But the one who does the will of my Father, who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. So here in this section, we'll just say that there are two different kinds of workers being described, or at least being alluded to. And the thing is, is that both of them seem to take on some kind of appearance of religion. But we're going to see that the Lord's acceptance, it hinges on one matter in particular. And He alludes to the fact that many are going to recognize the Lordship of God. You know, it seems as if this whole interaction, I'm imagining this interaction is happening at the final judgment. And there are going to be many, he says, that say, Lord, Lord. In other words, they recognize His Lordship. But again, there's going to be a clear distinction between part of this group and the other. Many will tell the Lord, well, I did this for you. Well, I did that for you. You know, I did many impressive things in your name. And so many people in today's world do this very thing that he's talking about here. They put a lot of effort into doing things in the name of the Lord. But there's a problem. He says, then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me. And then notice what he calls them. You workers of lawlessness. But wait! They had done all kinds of impressive things in the name of the Lord. They had all the appearances of being religious, but that's not what God was looking for. They practice lawlessness. Well, how is that? Well, that's because as he talks about at the end of verse 21, whatever it is that they were doing must not have been according to God's will. You know, while the, to the world it may have had the appearance of being devoted and being religious, 
if it's contrary to what God's will actually is, it's not pleasing to God. It's lawlessness. When we think about this topic of choosing to serve God, let's not fall into that trap that so many people fall into. Well, I like this. I like this. For example, we bring up the topic of worship. I like this in my worship. Well, God didn't say not to do this. God will be pleased with me as long as I am sincere. And sincerity is certainly a, pro- a part of it. But as we make the choice to serve God, it's important that we also ask, is this God's will? Is this what He wants? And I think this passage it shows us why being able to make this distinction is so important because it's only those that do His will that are going to enter the kingdom of heaven. If we are truly choosing to serve God, we'll choose to do what He wants, what He's designed. Let's not choose to do what we like and what we want, because if we go down that path, we're going to hear, I never knew you. What scary words those would be to hear. One more choice that He brings up, starting in verse 24. He says, Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house. But it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house. And it fell. And great was the fall of it. As we read through that section, you're probably thinking about the same song that I'm thinking about as I read through that passage. Of course, we know this passage because of that well-known children's song, The the Wise Man Built His House Upon the Rock, or the, or the, the song about the wise man. I'm not sure the exact title. And that song, of course, is memorable, and the children like it because I know there's like hand motions that go along with that. I'm not going to sing it this morning. I'm not going to do the hand motions for you. Uh, We'll wait until we go back to our classes for that. I remember growing up, my favorite part of that song, I don't know what this says about me, but my favorite part of that song was where at the end, the foolish man's house went splat. (laughs) That was my my favorite part. I don't know if it should be. (laughs) We understand the logic that it's always better to build a structure on a solid foundation. In fact, the foundation is one of the most important parts of the house. If you have a faulty foundation, the rest of the structure is going to suffer. It may even fall as we read about in this passage. Notice that even the one with the strong foundation that's described in this passage, it still goes through some trials. And that's true for us as well. Even if we're built on a strong foundation, we're not going to be exempt from trials. The road is hard, it says, right? When we're talking about the the different paths. But again, that hard path, it leads to life. Jesus tells us in this passage and other passages, this life, especially the life of a Christian, is going to bring a lot of trials and tribulations. And that is why it is so important for our foundation to be firm and solid. It's important because those, as this passage tells us, those that choose to build their house on the rock, they're going to be able to withstand the storm and the trials that face them. The storm still comes, but that house is not going to fall. This is contrasted, of course, with the foolish man who builds his house, it says, on the sand. I like the beach. But at the same time, I like the beach, but I've never really liked the sand. It's kind of a weird situation there maybe i just like the food that they they serve down there it's probably part of it you know sand is really not good for much in terms of serving as a foundation as this passage tells us and just like this passage tells us it's only a foolish man who would choose to build his house on the sand because when the storm comes perhaps not even a strong storm even just a light storm it may cause that house to fall flat because of where it's built or that foundation it's built on Of course, this whole illustration, it's meant to describe different reactions to the Word of the Lord. In both reactions, both of them have heard the words of the Lord, but he says it's the wise that hears the words of the Lord and then obeys them. 
We have to make the choice to ground ourselves in the truth of God's Word. Because if our foundation, if it's based around God's will, we'll be able to stand strong through the trials that will certainly face us. But, if we hear the words of the Lord and we choose to ignore them, He says that's to be foolish. Our foundation is going to be shaky and it's not going to last. Thinking about ways that we can build our house on shaky ground, building our foundations, as he says, on the sand. I think, especially thinking about our children, as they're building their foundations for their faith, even early on in life. What if our foundation, for example, is built on how we were raised? And I want you to hear me what, what I'm saying, because you may you know, raise an eyebrow at what I'm going to say. I think a question that the church needs to ask is we ask that eternal question of why are we losing our young people at such an alarming rate even after they're raised in very faithful Christian homes. I would suggest to you that their foundation, it was shaky because their foundation was merely what mom or dad had told them to do. Sometimes I fear that there's this disconnect where kids, they never make that connection because that I don't, that I follow God not because of what mom and dad said, but because I respect the authority of Jesus and His Word. If our foundation is merely based on how I was raised, and hopefully you were raised to, to respect the Lord, if it's just merely raised or, or, or founded on my parents or what the preacher said or what the teacher says, then we ought not be surprised that when we build that house and we build it on shaky ground, that it falls flat after some trial. What if my foundation, what if it is how the world thinks? What if my foundation is how I feel? What if my foundation is what Kevin wants? Just like before, we are on shaky ground in regards to eternity. Other passages allude to the fact that Christ is our rock. He is the foundation that we ought to build on. Thus, that's why we sing in that kid's song that I just referred to. So build your house. Where? On the Lord Jesus Christ. If we are choosing to serve God, no doubt, Jesus is where we need to build our foundation. He is that solid rock that we are to build on. So we get to our conclusion this morning. Verses 28 and 29, he says, And when Jesus finished, finished these sayings, the crowds were astonished at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one who had authority and not as their scribes. And again, this passage in 28 and 29 is not just talking about what we've talked about this morning. This goes all the way to what he's been talking about since Matthew chapter 5. When you think of all that Jesus has taught over these past three chapters, Is it any wonder why the crowds were amazed? Again, His teaching, it would have been so different even from what their current religious leaders had been teaching. them. Those that belong to the kingdom, they're going to practice a superior form of righteousness than what the world and what their religious teachers had been teaching them. It was a righteousness that He taught that prioritized the Lord in everything. And it was motivated by love. Love for God and love for one another. It also says that His teaching was different in that He taught, it says, with authority. Not like the scribes. And rightfully so He taught this way. He was no mere scribe that could just tell others what God had said. Jesus is Lord. He is the authority on God's will. Brethren, our reaction to the Sermon on the Mount, it ought to be the same as those that witnessed it here in Matthew 5-7. through We ought to be amazed by the words of the Lord. And we ought to take these things to heart and make sure that when we're making that choice on who we are going to serve, let's be like Joshua and make the choice to serve the Lord. Because it's only those that hear His words, as we've seen in this passage, those that hear His words and do the will of the Father that are going to enter into the kingdom that Jesus has been talking about here in this lesson. As we close here this morning, I would ask you, are you here today? And right now, your life is not being lived 
as one that has chosen to serve Jesus. If that's you this morning, I want you to understand you need to put your trust in the Lord and you need to submit to His authority. Otherwise, you're going to continue down that road to destruction. You're going to be thrown into the fire. The Lord will say that He never knew you. And as the song says, your house will fall flat. But here this morning, as you have breath, you can change that. You can get on that narrow way. You can start producing good fruit as he talks about. The Lord will call you one of His own. And your house will stand firm even through trials. But you have to choose to serve Him. If you're not serving Him now, I would tell you, start serving Him today. You will never regret choosing to serve the Lord. One more thing, if you're here this morning and you're not a Christian, I want to talk to you for just a minute. If you're not a Christian, let me encourage you to repent of your sins and turn to the Lord. Put your trust in Him. He has promised that He will save you from your sins if you do so. And He is faithful to that promise. He tells us that we ought to repent and be baptized for the remission of our sins. And you must resolve to live your life in service to Him. And then after this life is over, we can look forward to that heavenly home where He is. If you're here this morning and perhaps you have questions, you have questions about what you need to do to get your life right with the Lord and you're not yet sure how to go about that. If that's your case this morning, ask us. Ask me, ask one of the elders, ask Brother Eubanks, ask any of the members here. We care about your soul. And if you need help, and if you have questions, don't leave without asking those questions. But if right now, if you're here, and you know what you need to do. You're invited to come forward as we stand and as we sing the song that's been selected.